Hello? 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 Okay. <laughs> good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, can't let people hit hit start. I did. Okay. Perfect. So, um, welcome to Church at the Meadows. Um, I think I was looking at the weather forecast, and next Sunday the weather says a high of 82 and sunny. So let's take a vote. Everybody wants to be out here again. We are going to be here. I'm still hoping. I know. <laughs> So I think, um, well, I'll keep an eye on the weather, make sure that doesn't change. But as of right now, let's be back out here again next Sunday, shall we? Oh, all right. A um, couple of things. I'm going to do announcements at the beginning, um, just for the time being, because um, I've had some people say on Facebook, they're watching on Facebook, and they don't get the announcements because we save them for the end, and that's we usually turn it off at prayer time. So I don't. if you guys have announcements, let me know. But I think... The only announcement that I want to make is that next week, don't miss out, because I have a surprise for you. That's all I'm going to say. You're going to like it. You're going to like it. I have a surprise next Sunday. Brooks says you're missing out. Sorry, too bad. We're going to be at the beach. Too bad. Maybe they'll let know what it's a boy or a girl. I'm just asking, today's the day. But if it's not today, it'll definitely be on Thursday. She gets induced Wednesday night before we go to the beach. So. We're going to have a baby this but week. Today's her actual due date. So. And she, we needed the she lagoon should. yesterday morning. So that should have brought something. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the the barometer is going to drop. It's going to be tonight. There, I'll tell her. There you go. Run, run, run. Rich. Rich. I want to thank the church family for all the food. Jan's doing pretty good with the new knee. That, uh, I'm going to go to diet. <laughs> Absolutely great food. And thank you very much. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Uh, Carrie, how's Jenny doing? Big. Big. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. having a great summer off. One more month? How three much? Three more weeks. Oh, three wow. weeks. Three weeks. <laughs> yeah, mothers don't share those notes because if they did, there would never be siblings. <laughs> Savannah Marie. Savannah Marie? Oh, what's oh, a little Savannah? All right, any other announcements? All right, sounds good. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer and then we'll go to worship? Father God, I thank you for the gift of your presence out here this morning. I thank you for the beautiful, beautiful morning that you've given us. And Father, most importantly, I thank you for the breeze to keep us cool and enjoy this morning together. Father, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that your spirit is free to roam in this place. Lord, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who tore the tapestry separating us from the throne room. That we have the privilege and the honor through the blood of Christ to enter in. That we worship you not from a distance, Lord, but right up close. Lord, and we pray that our worship this morning brings you great joy. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Would y'all please stand? They can move around and kind of kind of focus circle. Yeah, because we want to have the music come up from the middle. It has a little better acoustic in there. So. Um, bulletins and lyric sheets on that back table back there, if anybody wants them. Thank you. 
Father God, may you find our worship this morning a sweet smelling sacrifice. We pray that it makes you smile. In Jesus' name, amen. So, whoops. A couple things before I get started. Um, I ran into a crew of vagabonds and homeless people, and you'll see them all over here on the side. generation kids. Well, it's getting harder because the third the third round of cousins, third level cousins, raise your hand, third level cousins, there's three of them here today, um, college students, and because the rest of them are off on jobs and they're traveling, they're doing everything with the little ones, so it's hard to get the little ones together. So we decided, the second generation, we decided that we needed a second generation cousin camp. It was only fair, right? We tried to have it somewhere with palm trees for a number of years, and we couldn't really kind of quite get that pulled off. So the only thing better than palm trees is mom's house. <laughs> and we got three of the first generation. So this is my family. These are the women. We had women's cousin camp this weekend. So just say hello. Don't ask them any questions, because what happens at cousin camp stays at cousin camp. <laughs> Amen. That's all right. <laughs> So I was standing over there, I was telling the guys, the, the worship team while we were singing or praying this morning, that I was, I, I ran around in circles, Caitlin is my um, videographer today, I ran around in circles trying to figure out where to put that thing because, I mean, I know you guys don't like to be on it, and so I'm trying to honor that request and trying to get everything that's going on, and we're using the whole pavilion, it was just being very difficult. And I had this fleeting thought, well, I could put it down there if I moved the cross, because if I moved the cross and they could see me, and I kind of went, whoa, whoa, how whacked is that? <laughs> I repented. Like, how, 
we do that though sometimes. We move out of the cross out of the way so he can see us because we want to be seen and it's about the cross anyway. So y'all just going to have to look around the cross to see me. That's all right. That's how it works. So we've been talking about our series on the names of God because we understand that we can't step into deeper relationship with him if we don't know who he is. We think we know. But what we're learning is that our awareness and understanding of who God is has been corrupted over time. We've lost the fullness of the understanding of who he is. And so by studying his names, he reveals aspects of his nature. And so today we're in, um, we're going to be in the book of Jeremiah. And the name Jehovah Sikhanu, you'll see it in your bulletin, it's, print, it's spelled T-S-I-D-K-A-N-U. So how many of you have read canoeing? Right? So if you see canoe with an emphasis on the C, that's how you pronounce it. C canoe. And it means God our righteousness. And so before we read that, let's backtrack just a little bit. We are in a cycle of, of events in the Old Testament that is wash, rinse, and repeat, right? It's rebellion and sin, punishment and discipline, repentance. And deliverance. Wash, repeat. I mean, that cycle over and over and over and over again. And we're still in that cycle. We haven't learned much in thousands of years. And there's a verse in Judges that describes the situation very well. It says, in a world where Judges 21-25 says, where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And in the description... I thought about this concept of righteousness because righteousness is kind of a Christian term. Nobody ever really uses that term outside of Christianity. And if they do, it's in the concept of self-righteousness, and we don't like it. So self-righteousness is putting myself in the middle of, of everything, right? We don't like that. But we don't really use that term, so we don't understand what it means. Romans 10.3 says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, having not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. And isn't that true of what's happening? On the, on the Facebook post, I put, we all live in this world today where we don't even have a clear understanding anymore of what's right and wrong. It's, it's right according to my standard. And if I think I'm right, then all y'all are wrong. But if I have a different opinion, I think I'm right and all y'all are wrong. We can't, we can't stop and listen. We can't have a conversation about it because we all stand, really, that's self-righteousness, isn't it? We, we, we've all carved out a niche of what we think is right. But the problem is all of that is wrong. <laughs> the entire standard is off base because the person that set the standard for righteousness was God, not us. We don't even come close. And so what's happened is we've tried to create our own sense of righteousness because we were created to be in relationship with God. We cannot be, we'll talk about this in a little bit more, we cannot be in relationship with God fully without righteousness. And since he created us, there's like a homing beacon inside of us that craves righteousness. So many would say we have an inherent sense of what's right or what's wrong. Well, that's just not right. You just don't treat people that way. Okay, great. Where did that sense of perspective come from? God. It's a fragment of what he placed in us that has been tarnished over time. So let's take a look at that. God is the standard. God sets that standard. I would never trust our own innate sensitivity of what's right and wrong to determine that standard. And let me give you some examples. Slavery. There were people at one time that thought that was right. When Aaron and I went to Nicaragua, we toured the Mayan ruins. And the Mayan culture at that time worshipped some gods that they thought was right. And part of the behavior that they did was they sacrificed babies. They threw them in the cenotes, the, the, the fresh pools of water, and they, they threw tons of um, offerings down there, like gold and, and, and all kinds of stuff in there because they were making an offering to that God. They thought 
it was right. Their entire culture rotated around that. And they're, they're, the, the historians talk about a phase of enlightenment where they started, the Mayan culture started to realize that these gods we were worshiping were not real. And that mindset, that revelation, eventually led to the demise of the entire culture. The story goes that in Nazi Germany, when they were carrying Jews in um, to be slaughtered in concentration camps by train, these trains would whistle through the countryside and they would go past these small German communities, oftentimes on a Sunday morning, where German Christians were worshiping. They could hear the trains rattling as they were in church whistling. And I don't know if this is verified or not, but the quote goes, somebody talked to somebody and asked him, what would you guys do? And he goes, well, we sang louder to cover up the sound. I, I would never, see, I don't trust our definition of what's right and what's wrong. <laughs> At some point in time, we have to step back and understand who set the standard. There's a plumb line, and we get off of that. <laughs> Right? If you've ever tried to pick out paint, you understand how many colors for yellow they can come up with? Right? It's great. Well, well, morality and our sense of rightness is kind of like that. But the true yellow is the plumb line. That's God. And that is what is being talked about today. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. I'm crackling, sorry. So let's read in the book of Jeremiah. Um, Jehovah Sikanu is mentioned in the Old Testament twice. And both is in the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to read both to you. And I'm in Jeremiah 23. If you have your Bibles, flip over. I'm going to start reading in chapter 1. And what's interesting, or verse 1, what's interesting about this is that Jeremiah was speaking to the leaders of the people, the priests the people who were guiding thought in that day, the people who were teaching, who were, who were um, enforcing morality, so to speak. And he says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the shepherds who feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doings, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set shepherds over them who will feed them, for they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And in his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell in safety. Now this is his name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteousness, Jehovah Sikhanu. And if you turn over just a couple more pages, we find almost the same thing again in Jeremiah chapter 33. No, it's fine. I love it. Um, so we're in Jeremiah 33, verse 14. Jeremiah here is talking to... Um, Jeremiah is in prison at this moment, by the way. And he's talking to the Israelites. And he says to them, behold, in verse 14... The days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Sikhanu. Now, here's what's interesting about these, if you didn't catch it already. Those two verses are messianic prophecy. They are predicting the coming of Jesus. Jesus, we know, was born in Bethlehem. 
He was born in the lineage of David. That's exactly what they're talking about. 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. Jeremiah was speaking the words of the Lord to prophesy his coming. And he was talking about righteousness. How many of you... How many of you had rules to follow at home? I'm looking at my kids. <laughs> How many, raise your hand if you had rules you had to follow at home? Yeah, absolutely. Kiddos, why do you, as kids, why do you have that rule? Don't overthink it. Why do you have that rule? Because mom said so, right? <laughs> exactly, that's what I mean. Thank you, Corey. Because mom said so. Why? Because it's her house. <laughs> And if you've ever gotten that, if you're going to live in my house, you're going to pay attention to my rules, right? <laughs> some of you got that. Some of you still need that. Um, and if you decided that you didn't want to live according to those rules, you had a decision to make, didn't you? Anybody ever try to run away from home? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can I tell a story about Megan? She clearly didn't like the rules of the household. She was told me she was going to run away from home. I don't know, she's probably eight years old or something. Who's going to run away from home? And I'm picturing, you know, my world, I'm picturing knapsack, stick over the shoulder, just like in the, exactly, right? I said, so Megan, where are you going to go? What are you going to take? And she goes, I'm taking a Garmin and a phone book. <laughs> <laughs> taking the GPS and a phone book. And the people at church, well, you just give her my address. Don't. Egg or on. Okay. <laughs> rules were made for a reason because if you're going to live in a particular household, you're going to follow certain rules. And I think I'm going to talk about this concept of righteousness for just a minute because it's an interesting concept and one that I think we put a little bit out of context. And I want to kind of try to bring it back into context on what it is exactly. No parent likes to be questioned. It's my rules. It's my house. I created you. Brought you into this world. God has all... <laughs> God has all power and all authority. And so the story goes... See, we think of righteousness as adhering to God's rules... And we understand the concept of sin... But sometimes this concept of righteousness... Honestly, I wrestled with it because, really, it seems kind of cruel, doesn't it? Why would God expect righteousness of us knowing that we can't live up to that standard? I mean, what is this, a bait and switch? What, does he need to, why can't he, I've said this more than once in my life, why can't he love me just the way I am? Mistakes and all. And now, don't get me wrong, he does. Okay, But this pursuit of righteousness is something that I really, really wrestled with. And I thought to myself, okay, so what opened up for me is that we understand righteousness, but according to the wrong context. And to or understand the concept of righteousness according to the proper context, we have to go way back in your body. I mean, way back. I'm talking page one. God created the heaven and the earth. God created everything you see around you, even the people sitting next to you, and he called it good. And in that moment, in that time, in that season, however long it was that Adam and Eve, do you realize that they got to walk with God through the garden? They hung out with him. They chatted with him. <laughs> they knew him in a way that we dream of. And along comes a snake. And you know the story, right? The snake tempted Eve. Eve ate. She gave the apple to Adam. Adam ate. Disobedience. Walk in faith. As we've talked about this. What happened in that moment was not just a sin. It was a transference of authority. Because God had given them a command. So they were obeying God. The moment they obeyed the enemy, authority transferred. And they ate the apple, right? Their eyes were opened. God did not want them to live in the garden in that state. So out of mercy, 
he kicked them out, set the flaming sword. But what happened was sin entered the world. <laughs> so when we talk about this concept of righteousness, the standard that God set for us was way back in chapter 1 in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. That was the original design. That was his heart for us. That was the reason behind why he, he wanted to commune with us. He wanted to be in relationship with us. He didn't want all this sin stuff going on. And in that garden, Adam and Eve were perfect so that they could walk with God and talk with God. You realize in the presence of a holy God cannot be sin. It can't exist. You cannot enter depravity, chaos, hatred. God is perfect and holy and righteous. And when he sees us, he doesn't just see us with that dirt. He sees us according to how he created us to walk with him in the garden at the beginning of time. That's why, remember last week when we talked about Gideon. And Gideon, during the Assyrian um, 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 uh, onslaught, was hiding in a wine press, threshing wheat. He was hiding. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and says to him, what? Oh, mighty man of valor. Dude, he's a big chicken. What? Why? Because God didn't see the dirty, broken, scared, frightened Gideon. God looked at him and saw the Gideon that he created and ordained for Gideon to be before the original sin. Does that make sense? So when God speaks your identity over you, he speaks what he saw in you, what he created in you before sin entered the picture and messed everything up. That's how he can speak. He alone has the capacity to speak beauty over you. He created you. He saw it. That's what he wanted for you. When sin messed that up, we got kicked out of the garden and God's thinking, okay, I've got to restore my people. I, they can do this. And he gave them the book of the law and said, just do this. And he said, now, if you'll orient your entire life around me, in fact, I want you to camp all the way around me. We talk about where the Israelites camped around the tabernacle. And I want to be part of what you wear. I want to be part of what you eat. I want to be part of what you say. And when you say it, every aspect of life was ordained by God. Why? It was in an effort to bring them back to his original intent, but it's not going to happen because sin had entered in. The standard, the plumb line was off. The standard was messed up. God sees us. When he looks at us, he sees us pre-serpent. Do you know that? When he calls out identity over us, he sees us pre-serpent serpent and that's what he speaks over us he's not so much trying to make something good out of something bad with this standard of righteousness as he is trying to restore us back to our original design that's his heart for us but what happens is we look at each other we compare ourselves to each other but God's comparison for us is according to the garden. And he looks at us and he says, y'all ain't coming into my house looking like that. I can't have you in my house looking like that. Like a kid that comes inside money. It's not like you don't love them. You love them, absolutely. Absolutely. Does it change who they are as a person? Absolutely not. Do you believe in them? 100%. Do you love them? 110%. But guess what? Y'all ain't coming into my house looking like that. We're going to wash you first. Right? So the, the journey of the Old Testament is all these people trying and trying and trying to adhere to laws, and we have the cycle of wash, rinse, and repeat. It's not going to happen. So let's talk something else about righteousness. Here's another fact that I want you to get. Righteousness is not external. It's internal. It's a spiritual thing. 
We can put all the good faces on. We can all comb our hair and put on our best jeans. We can, you know, doll it up. We can smile. We can say all the churchy things. But God's looking at the inside. That's the part that he wants clean. That's why we have to be so careful not to judge other people because we don't know what's going on inside their heart. We don't know where they're at. Righteousness is internal. How many of you realize that Everything external is rooted in the internal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We manifest, that's not quite the right word, we live into our self-perception. We live into our reality. So we have to clean up how we see ourselves on the inside. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from that. Why? Because it's the heart when it's focused in the right place, when it's focused on God. Matthew 5, 6, hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's a craving. It's an appetite that comes from the inside. I'm not externally hungry. I might be external. If it looks good, I want to try a piece of it. doesn't mean I'm hungry. doesn't mean it's good for me. But my hunger is something truly, when I'm really hungry and thirsty, it comes from the inside. There's something I have to satiate on the inside. And my craving, because of this homing beacon that God, God who put in me from the moment I was born, my homing beacon is toward him. I get that mixed up, though. I try to fill that with other things. I think other things can fulfill that hunger. No, the only thing that can fulfill that hunger is God. The only thing. That's the only standard. And what we found out in the Old Testament, and even now we see it around us, is it's trying to do it ourselves is an impossible task. Completely impossible. My friend Ron um, in Springfield recently had an issue with his computers. He's a, he works from home. He's got a very small home business. He does computer IT consulting. Does anybody know what ransomware is? Anybody had it happen? <laughs> ransomware is, there are professional hackers out there that find people that they think have a lot of money. So they look for businesses. IT companies are a huge target for them. They don't know that Ron was small potatoes. They hacked into his system, locked it down from him. He couldn't get in anymore, and they demand a huge amount of money to be paid to them before they unlock all of his files. But Ron's got something on his side that not many people know about. I won't go into all the detail, but Ron is a very devoted man of God, and he is a warrior, and he, the first place he dropped was to his knees. And long story short, he didn't lose any of his clients. He um, had a guy help him negotiate. He, did, he had to, I think he had to pay, but maybe just a fraction. Actually, no, 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 that's not true. He didn't have to pay. They did a, a, a loss analysis and decided that the best way to move forward was to just close down the system, wipe it clean, and compl start completely over. And he did, and he's doing fine. And I share that example with you is because that's kind of what God did. <laughs> We know that early in the Old Testament, man got so depraved that God sent a flood, a fl what did I say, a flood, to wipe the earth clean and to start fresh with the righteous man, Noah and his family, Shem, Ham, and um, thank you, Jephthah. And he promised that he would never do that again. I got to believe that hurt him a lot <laughs> to wipe out his own creation and start fresh. But good news, he's not going to do that again. So he tried to give us the laws to follow. Guess what? That's not working. He understands that fundamentally, besides because it's an inside job, the only way to reestablish our righteousness before God is death. He has to wipe the system and start over. Don't get scared. Jesus did that for you. Scripture says he didn't just take on sin. Scripture uses the words he became sin. On that cross, death, he died. He, what were the last words on that cross? 
God, why have you forsaken me? Because that moment of closure, that moment when he became sin and death, he was completely cut off from his father. I don't ever want to know what that feels like. For the Son of God to cry out, why have you forsaken me? But guess what? <laughs> he rose again on the third day, and that's what we celebrate today with communion, the gift of what he gave us. He wiped the slate clean. Complete system reboot. And all we have to do is believe in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, God made Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in him. It is only in Jesus that we are reestablished to righteousness. Listen, we were so depraved because of humanity's sin on the earth that we couldn't even enter the Holy of Holies. What happened when Jesus died became sin and took it to hell for us. The veil that separated the Holy of Holies, the temples, that separated the presence of God from everybody else was torn in half, top to bottom, completely. Why? Because our righteousness was reestablished before God. We have access before God. What we could not do, Jesus the perfect one did. Romans 5.19 says, For as one, by one man's disobedience, Adam and Eve, many were sinners, but also by one man, capital M, Jesus, obedience, many will be made righteous. Notice it says many, not all. There's a requirement there. And it seems so easy, we get tripped up over it. It's like, we, we can't do that. All we have to do is believe. We have to accept Jesus as our personal Savior. And we have access to it. And sometimes it's so easy that we think it's, we try to make it more complicated than it really is. Romans 10.4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. The law is gone, gone, done, obliterated. All that stuff, journey through the Bible, Ex Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it is great for perspective because we can look at those three books and we can go, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Ephesians 4. Um, okay. There, I told you that death was required. Scripture says that we are dead to sin and alive to Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4. And that we put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. We are a new creation before God. When God looks at us now, he doesn't see what we see. He sees our true identity. Do we still make mistakes? Yes. That's why we run to him. We're shoving past people to get back to him as fast as possible to wash those mistakes off so that we can stand in re-righteousness. That's forgiveness and repentance that God has promised us. I want you to hear something. I, I looked up Romans chapter 3, but I looked it up on the, the Passion Translation. I want you to just listen to this for a second. But now, independently of the law, the righteousness of God is tangible and brought to light through Jesus, the Anointed One. This is the righteousness that the Scriptures prophesied would come. It is God's righteousness made visible through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And now all who believe in him receive that gift. For there's really no difference between us, for we've all sinned and are in need of the glory of God. Yet through his powerful declaration of acquittal, God freely gives away his righteousness. His gift of love and favor now cascades over us, all because of Jesus, the anointed one has liberated us from guilt, punishment, and the power of sin. 
Jesus' God-given destiny was to be the sacrifice to take away sins. And now he is our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. We come to him for mercy, for God has made a provision for us to be forgiven by faith in the sacred blood of Jesus. This is the perfect demonstration of God's justice because until now, he has been so patient, holding back his justice out of his tolerance for us. So he covered over the sins of those who lived prior to Jesus' sacrifice. And when the season of tolerance came to an end, there was only one possible way for God to give up his righteousness and still be true to both his justice and his mercy to offer up his own son. So now, because we stand on the faithfulness of Jesus, God declares us righteous in his eyes. Isn't that beautiful? Jehovah Sikani. In the middle of their sin and depravity and disgust, God was declaring, I am your righteousness. I am restoring you. I am going to make a way for you to all come back to me. Make no mistake, every man, woman, and child will stand before God and be judged according to our righteousness. If Jesus took our sins upon himself for us, God will declare us righteous. If he didn't, if we just never got around to accepting Jesus as our personal Savior, then we will be judged according to the standard. He's not going to ask us which standard to use. It's going to be his. Because you see, if you're going to heaven today, it's because you're going on credit. God cannot and will never lower his standard of perfection to allow you into heaven as a sinful being. You enter in only through the forgiveness of your sins, which comes through the sacrifice of Christ. It's this concept of righteousness that's tough. God isn't angry at us. He's not playing bait and switch. He made a way for it to be reestablished through Jesus. It's the only way. And as we go into communion this morning, that's what we're honoring. We're honoring and remembering what Jesus did for us. It was no small feat. He was completely innocent. He was completely perfect. And scripture says sin. He became sin. He was beaten on the cross till he was almost unrecognizable and became sin to bridge the gap. Living a life in passionate pursuit of righteousness is that call in our hearts to be before God. But it's tough because the call of righteousness doesn't always feel good at the moment. Matter of fact, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness like God tells us to, it's a tough journey because we're gonna be acutely aware of our own sinfulness. But the only way to pursue it is to allow God to scan your life and invite him in to reveal your sin to you so that in his mercy and his grace, he can give you what you need to overcome it. It is not something you do on your own. It is a gift, freely given. So as we enter into communion, I'm going to give you just a minute. I'm going to kind of share what's going to go on. If you um, don't have communion with you this morning, there are baskets in the back and there are cups for crackers and juice. Pull yours out or go be, feel free to go grab some. Erin, I'm gonna need your help with communion. I'm gonna stay here and read through it if you'll hold up the elements. Yes.
So as we're doing communion this morning, I'm going to bless it. I've got um, a little thing I'm going to ask you to recite as we bless the communion elements. And then what's going to happen is the choir, the worship team is going to come up here and sing, Oh, Come to the Altar. And in the middle, you'll notice that we, our big cross is there, and at the bottom are chains. We sang this morning, Amazing Grace, Our Chains Are Gone. In the back, back there, and I'll go grab it in just a minute and move it up front. There is a basket with not just your prayer request cards, but there's also a basket with um, cardstock or little orange cards, whichever you want. And there's ink pens. Pardon me? Uh, just sit it on that picnic table right there. And I'm going to give you the opportunity why the choir is singing. Now, the camera is going to be directed. I'll have you come down here when the worship team comes up to sing, I'll come to the altar. Because anybody listening on Facebook, watching on Facebook, will only see this. If you're listening on Facebook this morning, you have a part in this too. But they're not going to see you if you come up here, okay? So don't worry about that. I always protect privacy. Don't worry about that. This is between you and God. If there is something, a chain that you are still carrying, I want you to just write it on that card and come up and wad it up in a ball and throw it down at the foot of the altar with the chains because you need to be reminded that Jesus' death took that from you and he carried it to hell and he left it there. Amen? And sometimes we forget that, don't we? I will also be off to the side if anybody wants to pray. It might be a good time even just with you and God in your prayer time. Renew your baptismal covenant. Renew your conversation with him. Renew your, your, your willingness to serve him and to love him and to pursue righteousness. So feel free after we take our communion do the blessing. While they're singing, if you want to grab something and write it down, don't be shy. Okay? Nobody's going to sit and read them. We don't roll that way. We're going to burn them after it's done because that's where they're at. They're burning, right? <laughs> so as we do communion, would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, I bow before you in humility and ask you to examine my heart today. Show me anything that is not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering my relationship with you. I know that I am your beloved child, having received you into my heart and life and having accepted your death as penalty for my sinfulness. The price you paid covered me for all time, and my desire is to live for you. So would you take your bread, please, or your cracker, and just hold it up? As I take the bread, representing your life that was broken for me, I remember and celebrate your faithfulness to me and to all who will receive you. I can't begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, yet you took that pain for me. You died for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave me life, abundant life now, and eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, I too receive this bread in remembrance of you. Please respond. Lord, I thank you for this awesome gift and renew my personal covenant with you today. And then take your bread. If you would take your juice or water, hold it up. And in the same way as I take this cup, representing your blood, poured out from a splintered cross, I realize that you were the supreme sacrifice for all my sin, past, present, and future. Because of your blood shed for me and your body broken for me, I can be free from the power and penalty of sin. 
Thank you for your victory over death. You took the death that I deserved. You took my punishment. Your pain was indeed my gain. And today I remember and celebrate that precious gift of life you gave me through the blood that you spilled. Repeat after me. Lord, I thank you. For your ultimate act of love. I confess my sins before you now. And thank you for washing me clean and setting me free. You may now take your juice. Ask the worship team to come up, please.
Facebook, if you have prayer requests, you know how to get a hold of me. Please let me know, um, and we'll hold that in prayer. We love you. Have a great day.